we will welcome first um, those who are joining us for the first time to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evacuation New Zealand and our platinum sponsor for Pulse International. <clears throat> Before we go ahead, we have an important announcement for those of you who are uh, joining us from Australia. You will have in your inbox an email entitled Important Update for the uh, GADMC Delegates. It talks about a glitch in the schedule for uh, Australians, especially for those who want to listen to our colleagues in New Zealand. It's a four hour glitch. So we encourage you to go to our website and check on, on the updated version. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping bits. The Zoom, chat, the Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so you can please make questions and answers ahead of the end of the uh, presentation in the, feed, in the questions and answers feature. And we'll try to answer them. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captions, so if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, click on that icon. Um, and as a reminder, the video recording of this presentation will not be available until it's been edited and released later during the year. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Slade McLean. I hope I pronounce it right. <clears throat> Director at Total Fauna Solutions in Australia. You would be McLean in Costa Rica, by the way. <laughs> Probably different in another country. And the, the, uh, the very suggestive title of his presentation is When They Can't Leave. Um, and um, I think the floor is yours, Mr. McLean. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here. Um, all right. Uh, obviously, the title of my uh, chat this morning is When They Can't Leave. Uh, a bit of a history on, um, sorry, a bit of a history on the company profile and what we do. My background, I was with the RSPCA for nearly 17 years and uh, where I gained a lot of my experience and a lot of contacts within the industry and learned a huge amount and started in emergency management response relevant to natural disasters relating to animals. Uh, my company profile is we provide captive population management services, consultancy for legislative compliance, animal welfare services. Capture, handling, capture and handling of domestic livestock, native and exotic, swift water and flood rescue, technical animal rescue, tranquilization and darting, transport logistics, vertebrate pest management, emergency management and deployment capability services. Our staffing uh, incorporates uh, two vets on staff, one on the contract, one on the books. Uh, um, we have a range, all our staff are very specific in their roles, so they have, a lot of them have other full-time roles and they're specialists in their field and they come on board as required during these times. Our most recent experiences with animals in natural disasters were back in the 2019-2020 fires in Australia and most recently it was the 2021-2022 flood events in New South Wales. Prior to that, in my previous employment, my experiences had been at Cyclone Larry in 2005 in far north Queensland, Maitland floods 2007, and the Blue Mountains fires in 2013. What did we do and how were we involved? The services we provided incorporated transport and logistics. Um, we provided land and marine um, options and uh, services and we worked in conjunction with the state emergency service who provided at that time aviation services for food drops. Impact assessments and euthanasia, managing and staffing a large animal evacuation centre which incorporated uh, small animals as well but mostly large animals and as you can imagine um, people turned up with anything and everything there from emus to horses, cattle, uh, yeah, you name it, it came in on trucks and we had to house it. Uh, unfortunately, but a, real, a reality of the uh, you know, natural disasters is deceased animals. So we provided recovery and disposal of disposal operations, uh, interagency operations in dynamic areas of high risk and provide domestic large animal and wildlife vets to assist as required. 
by the government departments that contract to see. Equipment, considerations in emergency situations, the equipment. Know your capability and capacity. Have you got the equipment to deal with what you think you'll encounter and plan on needing more? Go big and go big early. Better to have and not need than need and not have. Anyone that, like I've turned up, been given a briefing and not had enough equipment. And it's the worst feeling in the world because you just feel like you've fallen short. Um, so now our basically company policy is we go as big as we can, bring as much as we can. And if we don't need it, well, then that's great. Um, ensure you're briefed. I'm gonna say, the, you know, talk about briefing throughout my chat. Um, it is imperative whether it's be from local knowledge or agencies giving formal briefings every day, every time you turn up or throughout the duration, every 12 hours, go and keep up to date with your briefings. The animals in question, what are they? What do you think you're actually gonna get? And for, again, from those briefings, what have they told you you're going to encounter? Do they play well with others? What's, you know, do people on your team have that experience to be able to deal with what you're potentially going to um, encounter. Are they native, introduced, or even are you going to, account, going to encounter pest species? Animal behaviour. Is the behaviour of one of the species going to impact the others that may be displaced in a small area or a conform, you know, of a, a structure that they may have been you know, evacuated to? Uh, members of your team, as I just said before, experienced with what you're going to encounter. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. McLean. Yes. Could you speak closer to the microphone? A lot of people are really interested and can hardly hear you. Okay, is that better? Perfect. All right. Um, are they are they yarded? What, what you you know? Some of these animals we're going to encounter they're yarded. Others are free ranging, and again, some are going to be confined into structures. Those structures are going to change from a house to a flat, a factory, stable, or large shed. PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. It's not gonna save you if it's in your truck. Sometimes it's a pain to actually carry it out there in the field. Um, my staff, backpacks, take all the PPE that you're gonna need because if you've got five sets, you're probably gonna need seven. Depending on the type of situation you're dealing with, contaminated water, septic, sewage, unknown chemicals in the water, fuels, corrosives and oil, is what you're gonna likely encounter, all of which would normally require a hazmat response. One size doesn't fit all when it comes to PPE and you can't always make it fit. So ensuring that everyone there prior to deployment has appropriate gear that's gonna fit them for the, for the circumstances that you're working in. Your medical considerations relevant to the animals in the field that you're gonna see. Providing, a vet, providing vet treatment in situ versus evacuation and treatment in a clinic. Time, resources, and their condition as assessed by the vet. This is all gonna come into play and it's gonna come down to the vet's assessment, whether we're gonna move it, leave it, treat it there, or euthanize it. Individual animal needs due to age, species, illness, or disaster related conditions that require a vet assessment. Again, having that vet there in the field or the ability to send images and video back to a vet for assessment of what you're looking at there is of great value. Zoonosis. Again, I refer back to PPE. In most cases, it's gonna limit the likelihood, but you've gotta be aware of it. The environment is obviously not what you're normally working in. Um, and you don't know what you're gonna expect off these different properties. Changing your PPE and following protocols for disinfection between properties, for an example, intensive farming and quarantine restrictions. Got rescue when it turns to recovery. Deciding it's time to euthanize. Native, domestic, livestock. You've got welfare considerations for treatment of short-term and long-term. Euthanasia in situ rather than moving them to another location. I'm not gonna focus on this heavily here. I've got a a uh, few slides on. We're discussing that a little bit more in depth. All right. What animals are you likely to encounter? Um, speaking here in Australia, and obviously, uh, you know, 
we're broadcasting around the world, we don't have thing, uh, a lot of animals here that when you go to put your garbage out of a night are going to um, come up for a sniff and potentially eat you. We don't get grizzly bears and the you know big cats. But I always believe, expect the unexpected. The majority of animals we're going to get here are going to be your companion animals. Our wildlife consists of koalas, macropods, emus, possums, birds, and flying foxes, reptiles, including snakes and crocs. Um, it wasn't natural disaster related. I had in my previous employment been called to a house for a, it was a human welfare issue. The person wasn't home when we went in. There was 170 reptiles, which included two saltwater crocs and a, a number of other exotic reptiles that shouldn't have been there that just no one knew were in the premises. So that's why I always say expect the unexpected. Uh, your exotics, snakes, primates, primates, big cats, livestock, cattle, horses, sheep, goats and alpacas. Um, looking at other species overseas, again, we don't have some of those really large, like further down, I'm speaking about bison and donkeys here. We don't have the size of animals that are overseas for consideration. Um, Why can't an animal be relocated? There may be large numbers. It's these things happen in a really short time frame. There may have been no forward planning on the part of the owner. They might be an absent owner, um, hobby farmists, where they've you know got livestock and animals there. They come down you know once a week. They've got their neighbours looking after the place. It's happened that fast. They can't get back there. They're not able to be um, evacuated. There's been no forward planning. The age of the animals, you're not gonna be able to move these animals due to a pre-existing ailment or illness and all their age creates an animal welfare issue. Situations that, you know, situations that require an animal euthanized rather than evacuate rather than evacuate it. Is it injured already? Does it have an ailment? That's, you know, you're not going to euthanize an animal or uh, evacuate an animal in that situation. You're going to defer to a vet and have that conversation and look at euthanizing it in situ. High risk to um, humans and the rescuers there. Is the risk greater than the reward? You're, again, it's sad, but it's not going to be, um, they're not going to put that animal's life ahead of the people. Members of public and interference. So many people in our experience when we've been to fires and floods, they've got fantastic intentions, but they haven't consulted with anyone. They're not liaising with other agencies and other um, teams that have been engaged and they've got their own plan. They've either let animals out, put them into an area that's you know, created more of an issue and compromised that animal's welfare preventing them from being able to be evacuated. We have a thing in Australia called a pick number. Um, pick numbers identify how many animals might be on a property, for example. People haven't kept their pick numbers up to date for record keeping. So when the government department is looking at that property going, all right, we've got a flood or a fire coming, how many animals are there? The numbers are just way off. There's either a huge number more or not as many as they planned for. Uh, this record keeping and it's just not up to date creates a, you know, um, an additional problem. The importance of the animal impact assessments, the minute you can get a team in there to actually have a look at how many animals, what species and what, what um, needs they have is critical. Sometimes it can be days before you can even get to that point. And by that stage, you've already got some major animal welfare issues requiring, requiring veterinary intervention and or euthanasia. Okay. Euthanasia considerations. No one wants an animal to suffer. Um, it's a hard decision. Not everyone's always going to be on the same page, but if everyone focuses on the fact that it's not about the individual, it's about the animal. Um, there's authorised persons in New South Wales being veterinarians, authorised bodies, RSPCA, Animal Welfare League, New South Wales Police, um, that have the authority to enter a property and euthanise an animal if it's deemed cruel cool to be kept alive. 
uh, services we provide if we're working in conjunction with the vet and or the owner, if the animal's assessed and it's deemed as it's cruelly kept alive or the owner does not want to um, remove the property, that will then authorise euthanasia in an emergency situation um, due to the fact it's just not practicable to get a vet there or, to, or evacuate an animal off the property, unfortunately. Um, there's some guidelines there, the Australian Veterinary Association guidelines state that euthanasia is used when pain and distress or suffering are likely to exceed manageable levels. It is a very emotive topic. I've seen animals during fires evacuated and intensive treatment applied and less than 1% have survived when they most likely should have been euthanized in that situation. It's just compromised their welfare and it's prolonged their suffering. And unfortunately, you know, it's a sad but true fact. There is a fate worse than death for some of these animals that are left out there. The, loca the considerations for euthanasia come down to, as I discussed, the location. Where are they? How, you know, can you get them out? Can you get them, you know, a veterinary assessment? It's interesting as well, euthanasia prior to impact of an area. Are these animals definitely going to get impacted and they can't be saved and they're going to drown or they're going to burn? That's it's a reality. I, it's just a consideration. Um, and that's not a decision that I make that comes down to some of the organisations and government departments we will contract to and the owners. Assessment of the animals, uh, food, water, shelter and veterinary treatment comes into play. Pre-existing conditions as discussed. Uh, failure to provide veterinary care prior to the event. There's animals that we've encountered that have been uh, just not well looked after. They, they uh, required veterinary care and or food, water and other. And by the time we've turned up, they're already compromised on the ground. And then once the event has come through, they are deemed as cruel to be kept alive. They've either passed away themselves or we've had to euthanize them in situ. Uh, the other conditions are it's existing body condition. They can't thrive on its own in its own environment. So we're factoring for wildlife as well. Um, most likely in the situations we've often encountered as kangaroos or macropods. Owner consent and or authorised persons as previously discussed and the veterinary assessment. We heavily rely on the vet's assessment and that's why we often take one in the field with us as part of our team. In situ feeding. When an employer and how is it managed? All right, so as we've discussed, not everything can come out. What's your ability to be able to get feed in to these animals? What species are you trying to cater for? Have you got road access today, but you're gonna lose that tomorrow? Have you got boat access today, but with the water level changes, you're gonna lose that tomorrow as well? With a varying number of animals on properties, it's very much a case by case and it changes. It can change within hours or a matter of days as to how you're going to get that food and water into these animals. A lot of the time, as discussed, the impact assessments can take a number of days to get to properties that might be very remote. Um, or you may have not had information that there was any animals there to start with and you'll get a phone call or someone will ring up and say, my neighbour down the road, there's an issue. They've got all these cattle that have been displaced. They weren't even there. They've just turned up, they're injured, require feed and otherwise. So uh, in the field, we'll make the assessment of how much food and water that we need to consider. What's the duration of the event that we're looking at? How long is this predicted to go on for? Uh, what are our options in relation to getting this food and water in there? And whilst in a flooded environment, uh, you know, off the top of some people's heads they're like there's there's water everywhere there it's contaminated water um the minute these animals start drinking you're just adding and compromising a situation even further than what it already is um, moving water on bulk into some of these environments is a, a more difficult task than providing the actual hard feed itself um 
what type of feed we're considering are we going to put in there to cater for the, the greatest number of animals. Um, we're going to have native animals in that same environment. We're going to have livestock in there and domestic pets as well. So we'll be considering putting dog food in, for example. You know, we're not putting rich, um, rich haze and that in there. Uh, we want to keep it as, you know, nutritionally valuable, but not placing a huge amount of high, you know, um, really rich food in there that's going to compromise some animals um, as they're just not used to it. The species, uh, species specific needs, um, some of these, you know, native animals are going to eat differently to what uh, livestock is. So we'll drop a mixed mixed amount. Sometimes we'll drop bag, uh, pellet, pellets as well as hays. How, whether that hay is dropped in small square bales um, out of a helicopter or if you're using a boat, they're just easier to move. Round bales, looking at the size of them, are great, um, but they're just not that easy to manhandle to get into some really difficult situations. Uh, pest species and predator management in these same areas. It's like Noah's Ark in some of the circumstances where you don't know what's going to get displaced and you can have a very wide range of animals, including predators and pest species in one small area. Um, trying to manage that can include removing the pest species in Australia, primarily, we don't, you know, we don't have, as discussed, a lot of big predators, but a lot of our pest species will predate on um, our native animals and domestic and livestock. So we will recommend in those situations to remove or eliminate the pest species that may have been displaced for the greater good. So we're looking at safety considerations for the responders. Um, risks from the animals when you're actually out there in the field. These animals have been displaced. Some of them won't have ever been handled. Um, you're not going to have an owner there to give you a history on them. Obviously, a lot of people in your teams are going to be very, they're going to be experienced and aware of what they're doing. The greater risk comes from risks from people in these environments. Um, looking at doing impact assessments at properties where no one's rung, you're seeing animals there, you're pulling up with a vet or a person from the Department of Industry or National Parks. You're out there just going for a wander to see what's there, trying to offer some help. Sometimes these people don't want that help and don't want people there. Um, an example of that is you know, people having guard dogs at meth labs that are remote um, or properties where they're growing cannabis and the like, and they've got animals in there as well that have been displaced onto their property and they do not want anyone there. It's, um, it's just a consideration and it's something I try and drum into our staff in relation to whilst you're in there focusing on the animals, be very broad minded and keep your eyes open because some people go to these remote areas because they don't want to be found. Uh, one of the case studies uh, from one of the most recent floods, this is an absent owner. Uh, the owner at this property didn't live close by, didn't have a motor vehicle themselves. They used to get a lift to get down to where their cattle were. They rang the after the emergency hotline that was put together. Uh, this hotline... Uh, relies on people to provide information, how many animals they've got, what type of feed they, you know, had been feeding, um, any veterinary issues that they may have encountered, like had with their animals, so we could try and cater for them as a whole. One of the challenges we experienced here was the water level changes in the, um, in that immediate environment due to the flood level changing um, and provision of fresh water on that site. So luckily enough, there was, you know, some fresh water up there as, seen in the picture of one of the houses but we had a limited amount um, these guys required uh, fresh drops every 72 hours uh, 48 to 72 oh, sorry to interrupt uh, uh, yes. Steve, uh, we have to wrap up sorry uh, sorry to interrupt you you need yep. to wrap up 
Okay, all right. Um, and, well, I had another two slides, but mate, we can, how many more minutes do I have there, Grana? A couple, and you have a question to answer if, okay. you, if you have time. That's all right. All right, um, just to answer that question, sorry. Um, Perfect. Oh, the question, right. you, you, you can't see it? I, I can read it yeah, to I know. you. When, I've got the question there. When dropping hay, do you drop grass as Perfect. opposed to Perfect. alfalfa mix? All right. Perfect. Yep. When Go it ahead. comes down to what we're picking as uh, supply, uh, a lot of the time in these areas, we were dropping oat and hay and the like. Uh, it also came down to availability of supply. Our suppliers had been impacted as well. We had two trucks going into state to obtain food out of area so it was trying to coordinate the type of food like we had oat and hay there were some properties on one of the occasions we couldn't get anything other than loose and which we then allocated out to a number of the horses the properties with horses on um, the loosen was just too rich for the cattle in some circumstances and we swapped over to pelleted food at one stage as well oh, i hope that answers your question uh quickly the next i'll jump to the last one some of the challenges for longer term water supply that we used on this last slide you'll be able to see the two ibcs with a water trough and float system the challenge there that gives us two thousand liters worth of fresh water and so it is quite intensive to get that volume of water into some areas that might be difficult to access. But once the water's in there, that's a substantial amount of water for, and it's going to last for a reasonable amount of time. We're having a look at road access limitations there on the first picture on the left. We wound up running like there was a car on the other side with a water container on it. We had some trucks come in and put some bulk water in the car container on the other side and it was able to be taken back to the property. Um, Aerial assets weren't able to be used in that circumstance due to the fact they were committed to firefighting operations. So everything had to be done by ground. Um, it was very, very labor intensive. In the second slide there, one of those sheds was for food storage. Um, and unfortunately the other shed housed some animals. Um, in that same region, there was a small privately owned wildlife park that had to let some of their animals go and to the best of my knowledge, there are currently still some of those animals potentially out uh, in the environment to this day um, as a result of not being able to get them back. Um, in wrapping up, uh, please feel free to reach out on our email for any additional questions um, or um, info we had a couple more slides and things to discuss but yeah thank you very much for your time thank you very much uh for the uh, the presentation it was really uh interesting especially because i love your the ecology of your country i know the uh challenges are huge and uh in a minute or less would you be able to discuss one of the uh, requests we made to the uh, uh presenters to this to uh speak about the possible intersections between your work and public policy and, and public legislation in 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 your area of expertise. Yes, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, what was that? Yeah, I was saying, would you be able to discuss in, in less in a minute or less the possible intersections between public policy and your work in the field? Okay. Um, so we're engaged, we don't, we don't work probably, we're engaged by government departments and animal welfare, a number of animal welfare organisations to provide the services that we do. So we don't work freelance, so to speak. Um, we don't deploy unless we're engaged by a department to um, attend in the field. We do provide some voluntary services in that aspect, but we don't overstep the mark. Everything that we do is a coordinated response. Um, if that's you know, the line that you're getting at. Yeah, uh, what would be the ideal situation for you policy-wise? Any, anything better or is it is it fine as it is? Um, 
I think there's a, a number of improvements, but a lot of it is about people communicating in a, you know, everyone's got great intentions. It's just a matter of getting everyone on the same page, going through the same channel to get the same result. Um, you know, so for well, yeah. everyone, everyone wants everyone wants the same outcome, but some some you know it's easy for people to get emotionally, uh, uh, yeah, emotions yeah. overtake. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that would be that would mean uh, working and planning uh, during peace times with the lawmakers, maybe. Yeah. Y yes, this is very true, um, and. Uh, Unfortunately, in, in Australia, each state has different legislation and uh, governed differently. Perfect. I thought uh, that was uh, very interesting. <clears throat> I wish we had more time. Uh, I think your answer was really interesting as well. My veterinarians, when we used to work in, the th in third world countries, were very mindful of, of the mixtures of feed and uh, the different scenarios and the different needs of the animals. So I thank you very much for this.